Henrik, before we start, can I just um, ask you just to give a couple of um, minutes of welcome to everybody, and then um, and then we'll go into a few short presentations, and then we'll have a start our debate. So, Henrik, just over to you for a couple of minutes of, of uh, introduction. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody, or or good afternoon if you are from Asia. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Sean, for for giving us opportunity to. Um, to uh, speak today about the Eastern European crewing and the uh, Ukrainian crewing in, in particular. Um, I'm also looking forward here to um, to hear what the other speakers have to say. I know some of it before, of course. Um, and I hope our, our uh, audience will get a good insight uh, and also use the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so I think everybody should be free, feel free to do this. If there are we cannot call all questions, I think then we can also clarify some of them by email afterwards, yeah? Good day, everybody. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, tell uh, a little about Ukraine uh, and how Ukraine came to be the source of the seafarers. Uh, so um, uh, Ukraine is, uh, from somebody knows, somebody not, uh, very close to uh, Russia at uh, the border with Belarus, Poland, uh, Slovakia, Romania, and Moldova, uh, connected to the uh, Black Sea and the Sea of uh, Azov. And uh, okay, one of the uh, uh, territorially, uh, one of the biggest European countries by the territory is uh, 600,000 uh, uh, square kilometers uh, with the population uh, for, do, for today, let's say is around uh, 41 and a half uh, thousand uh, people. Uh, uh, is um, of course uh, having the uh, huge large cities uh, um, among them uh, is our capital, uh, Kiev, uh, uh, such uh, industrial cities like uh, Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk, uh, Donetsk, uh, mostly the eastern part of Ukraine is the uh, uh, traditionally minor and uh, uh, production uh, cities. And uh, of course, Odessa is uh, also the uh, uh, one million city uh, citizens. Uh, uh, the other seafarer cities uh, are, in addition to Odessa, also Kherson, Ismail, Mariupol, uh, Sevastopol, uh, also Kiev, uh, Nikolaev, and Kerch. Uh, so this is uh, how it looks uh, on the map, let's say. We can move on. Uh, so uh, uh, Ukraine is um, uh, quite uh, known by its uh, largest uh, natural gas uh, reserves uh, in the world. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, let's say. Uh, so uh, this is uh, our uh, huge uh, capacity, of course, and is one of the largest uh, mineral producers uh, in the world. Uh, a lot of places are still being investigated and uh, worked around the country. Uh, can be next, uh, Sean. So also uh, in view that um, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, different uh, uh, historical places around the country is uh, Ukraine is attracting also a lot of uh, tourists uh, every year so around uh, 20 million uh, coming to see a huge uh, very nice looking city cities on the photo you can see uh, uh, Lviv uh, also Odessa is very beautiful looking uh, Kiev uh, uh, Kharkov in some sense uh, they are are similar, of course, in some senses they are uh, different depending on uh, the history, of course. So somebody knows, somebody not. Uh, Ukraine is, of course, uh, uh, one of the uh, top producers of the crops, including corn and wheat. 
and uh, also what is also related to the uh, marine and maritime, we have the a huge grain terminals uh, together with the bulk carrier shipments. So a lot of vessels in particular also bulk carriers uh, come into uh, Ukraine ports. Uh, also, some uh, uh, parts for the cars are produced in the country uh, among the uh, around 20, 12, uh, uh, 10, 12, sorry, um, companies uh, producing these uh, different things. And okay, so uh, here on the um, slide you see the numbers uh, for the gross domestic, domestic product, uh, which is 153.8 billion for 2019. In uh, 2020, the figure is uh, almost uh, the same. Uh, so uh, for 2020, the, just uh, for you to get the full picture, the uh, average salary, let's say, all over Ukraine amounted like uh, $350, $400. Uh, but uh, I have to say that uh, unfortunately still uh, a uh, huge difference between the big cities and what people earn there and uh, the rural areas. Um, that's it. So, and in view that we are uh, announce ourselves like a crew source of the future country, uh, so we have everywhere, every year, uh, um, around 12,000 uh, young new seafarers joining us uh, among the uh, total number uh, all over Ukrainian seafarers uh, is, uh, let's say, 146,000 uh, counting for the moment. You mentioned, um, you know, out, out of a, a 41 and a half million population, um, you know, they've got 146,000 seafarers. You know, what? Well, why has it become, why has Ukraine beca become such a large seafaring hub? What, what, what's the reason behind that? Yeah, so it is uh, historically uh, like this. Uh, the, uh, we are, have been uh, the seafaring country for some time, since uh, 1830s, uh, when the Black Sea Shipping Company was founded. And uh, it was growing in the Soviet times uh, and uh, after the uh, let's say World War II the, uh, it became uh, the, one of the biggest uh, shipping companies uh, with hundreds of vessels uh, and um, of course uh, when the company was growing also the uh, seafarers community was growing uh, and um, that time and also today uh, we face that uh, uh, you know, almost every family in Odessa, for example, um, was having some uh, seafarer member. Mm. <laughs> and uh, today in particular, we see that, and uh, we, it is really true that uh, we even sometimes have uh, both uh, uh, father and son working with us. So uh, we can even say that it is already third generation with uh, Danica, uh, who became the seafarers, chose the seafarers job. But when you when you look at um, the options for young people, you know, for, for job wise, I mean, uh, you talk there about an average monthly salary of 378 US dollars, which is quite, quite low, I think, really, in, in certain, certain economies. Um, is shipping, does is shipping then a very, very attractive alternative? Because because it is, it'll pay good money and it is a stable profession. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the right. Uh, it is uh, okay. Uh, the young generation uh, today have the right to choose. Uh, so, few options at the end. Uh, if you want uh, to make uh, good money, uh, let's say uh, you have either you can be some kind of IT developer uh, or you can. Um, have some private business uh, career at sea is uh, then uh, one of the 
most attractive, uh, I would say. Uh, or, okay, another one is uh, you can go abroad, of course, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, to look for something else. Uh, but many still choose, uh, especially in the marine cities, uh, there's a Nikolai, Kherson, Ismail. So many still choose, uh, looking at the father, what he was doing, and the grandfather, they still choose the maritime job uh, uh, as, okay, to develop and to prove yourself uh, to be a real man and uh, to secure the job for your lifetime. So. Okay, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, my name is Mikhail Miyusov. I am the rector of the National University Odessa Maritime Academy. Next slide, please. Uh, unfortunately, we have not statistic data about number of uh, seafarers in Ukraine, official data, but we have information from site of register of uh, uh, CIFARS uh, certificates, and now we have uh, about 146,000 uh, valid certificates of CIFARS, uh, and most of them are masters and officers. Total number of masters and uh, officers uh, more than 82,000. Next, please. Uh, now in Ukraine, we have five maritime universities and academies, and seven colleges, uh, which uh, five of them are subdivisions of universities and uh, academies, and uh, two uh, are separate. And uh, these uh, institutions are situated in Odessa, Kiev, Kherson, uh, Ilya, Ismail, and uh, Mariupol. Next, please. Uh, in year 2020, total number of students of maritime uh, specialties uh, leading to certificates of competency was uh, about 20,000, and annual graduation about uh, 6.5. Uh, and uh, most uh, 6.5 thousand. And, uh, most of uh, graduates uh, graduated from our university. Next, please. Uh, you can see the system of uh, maritime education in Ukraine. Now we have several levels of education, junior specialist, bachelor, uh, and master. Previously, we had uh, one more level specialist. Uh, next, please. Uh, and. Uh, we have four years of education uh, for bachelor and one and a half for master. But in accordance with uh, our legislation for receiving certificates of competency as uh, masters and chief engineers, it is obligatory to have a, a master uh, or specialist degree. Uh, now we have uh, 11 year secondary education, but in the future we already uh, have some changes in the, uh, our system. Uh, next, please. And uh, we have 12 months uh, uh, education. And uh, Odessa National Maritime Academy is a leading maritime higher education uh, institutions in Ukraine, which uh, was uh, founded in 1944. Academy is fully equipped uh, for STCW training. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, simulators for navigators, full mission bridge simulators, GMDSS, EGDIS, IES, uh, radar ARPA uh, simulators for engineers, full mission engine room simulators, workshops, uh, engine room for training, uh, for training of electrotechnical officers. We have electrical power plant equipment, high voltage equipment, PLC laboratory, etc. And uh, for all specialties, uh, we use uh, training sailing ship and uh, we have a uh, swimming pool with a special uh, center for uh, personal survival of sea and all uh, safety training facilities. Uh, the study programs uh, are approved by the Nautical Institute and uh, accredited by the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology. A quality management system is certified by Bureau Veritas. 
About half of our full-time st uh, students study free of charge at expense of state. The cost of training for contract students is about 1.5 thousand US dollars uh, for citizens Ukra uh, of Ukraine. Uh, Part-time education is uh, two times cheaper. Next, please. And on this slide, you can see uh, some pro problems and uh, prospects uh, which we have for uh, maritime uh, institutions uh, in Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Looking, looking at the, and there's quite a lot of diversity there in what you're doing there, but the studies themselves, how are they financed? Do, can you give me a little bit more information on that? Because, you know, you talked about part of the funding for the students were from the, from the state and what have you, but, um, I mean, are the studies themselves completely funded by the government? How does it work? Now we have a situation in Ukraine uh, when we have some uh, places which supported by government. In our academy, about half of our students study free of charge. Government supports uh, education fee, uh, scholarship for some students, and the rest of students uh, pay uh, themselves for the education. And we have competition uh, for places uh, which are supported by government. Now, Diversity in shipping is really important at the moment. I mean, it's, it, it's <clears throat> certainly is something that is uh, uh, striking a chord within shipping companies and what have you. Um, how, many, how many female students do you have? Is it something that you're really encouraging more, more, more women into shipping? And now uh, in our university, uh, the total number of uh, female students uh, is more than uh, 400. But uh, we have uh, different specialities, some of them uh, there for sure, and some of them leading uh, to certificate of competency. Uh, that's why uh, about 50 uh, persons, uh, female uh, persons, uh, are studying uh, for a future shipping uh, industry. But unfortunately, uh, most of companies uh, now uh, don't like uh, to employ and organize uh, onboard training for uh, uh, ladies, for ladies. And that, that's why some of them have problems uh, for future employment. I mean, well, one, one point also that I think a lot of students um, uh, struggle with, um, and this is not just in the Ukraine, it's all around the world, is that once they've come out of training is actually getting a cadet berth on board ship. I mean, how, how, how much of a problem is this? You know, because they need to get on board to get their sea time and, and to get their officers' licenses. Of course, uh, it is a problem uh, for students uh, because in accordance with the STCW convention, they have to have uh, 12 months of board training. Uh, and uh, in accordance with our curriculum, all these uh, 12 months we have during uh, four years of education. And uh, most of companies uh, prefer to have uh, already qualified and skilled uh, students, cadets, and most of uh, our partners prefer to have students uh, after 30 years of education. Uh, but uh, some of them uh, already uh, start uh, cadet programs uh, from second year. Uh, that's why usually uh, students of uh, first and second year of education have some problems. But during the uh, whole term of education, all of them receive uh, 12 months. Uh, and uh, uh, many of our cadets after graduation with bachelor degree continue their education for master degree. And during this time, one and a half year more, uh, all of them uh, already receive uh, needed uh, 12 months of training. And during last one and a half year, many of our cadets uh, already obtain uh, positions as a, a junior officers or watch officers and watch engineers. Thank you. My dear Roger, as here, there is, uh, as, as I think the last slide went away a little bit fast here in, uh, in the presentation, but but actually there is, uh, Ukraine do not have its own, basically no merchant fleet, yeah, at least not uh, the ocean-going fleet. And, and there's not only, 
there's not only a problem with the, let's say the pipeline for the cadets. One thing is that there's a surplus of cadets having problems to to find jobs. Yeah, we have many ABs uh, and OSs employed who are actually licensed officers because they did not collect the necessary sea times to get the. Uh, uh, to get their licenses. And the second thing is that uh, many companies actually are going for the Ukrainian top four senior officers and expecting they are on the market, uh, can find this on the market. But, uh, and, and few are taking the junior officers. Also, actually, there's also a surplus of uh, Ukrainian junior officers. Right. So there is, there is somehow a, a, a narrow place in the pipeline there that uh, everybody likes the senior officers, but also nobody really is uh, interested in educating them. How, how can that problem or that issue be resolved, you think, Henry, when you've got, you know, good junior officers there? How, how can that be resolved? Yeah, I, I see. I think the what we see is that uh, more, when we have new CPO owners starting working with us, they start with the senior officers and after some time actually they realize, yeah, we need a, we need a East European pipeline, so you need to take a certain part uh, junior officers and cadets as well, of course, to to have a pipeline so you develop your own senior officers. Uh, basically, we employed for uh, all the Balkarians that we have. Uh, uh, all the officers are from Russia or uh, Ukraine, mainly for Russian, I would say, uh, including uh, all the officers, uh, ETO and, uh, and fitters. So those are the ranks that uh, we are employing. Uh, I want to recall uh, a bit the, um, the topic about the cadets, because as a seaward we do employ cadets, but sometimes for the third parties means uh, for other owners we propose budget with cadets, but sometimes uh, they are telling us they don't want the cadets. So uh, we are aiming to have a cadet on board because as uh, Henrik was saying, uh, uh, we needed to have our pipeline of officer and future one. Uh, and also, if everyone is looking for an officer and no one's employing cadet, means that we are going to spoil the market because we don't give the, the new generation the chance uh, to, to join the ships. So everyone is looking mostly as a senior officer, but no one or very few are employing junior and very, very few are employing cadets. So means that uh, sooner or later, the, the officer will not be available anymore if uh, no one will employ junior officer or cadets. Just on that point, I mean, um, you know, what does the, it's been, a, it's been an issue and a problem for many, many years, you know, and, uh, you know, but what, what does the industry need to do, do you think, to, to rectify that? Because it's a catch-22 situation. It's a classic catch-22. It's, uh, it's, it's very easy. Uh, most of the ship owners saying that they don't have budget for, uh, for the cadet means that uh, some association organization needs to, need to provide this, uh, this training to them, possibly uh, less expensive than it is now. Uh, I'm referring about $350, $400 per month per cadet. That is nothing compared to higher ranks uh, or uh, the... OPEX cost of a ship, but some ship owner, they prefer to save $1,000 per, per month to not employ, the, to not employ the, the cadets. For example, some flag are giving a, a, a fiscal benefit for the companies that are employing cadets. So this one could be, could be a solution. I mean, to encourage by association, by industry, the employment of the cadet. Regardless of the nationalities, this is a worldwide problem that also affects uh, Ukraine and, uh, and the Russian market. So this is the, the only solution, to, to give benefit to the ship owner, to oblige them to, to place on board the cadets. So when you're employing crew for your for your vessels uh, and you're talking about um, split between russian and ukrainian what, what are you looking for what qualities are you looking for in the affairs itself well uh first of all i would say that uh, ukrainian are um, very well qualified uh, the education is extremely good uh, I'm talking about uh, deck and engine, but the quality, for example, that we can find about uh, fitters and the ETO, according to me, it's uh, unique in the, in the world. They have a long background of people working in the, in the shipyard. So this is uh, good to find the excellent uh, welded fitters along with uh, the officer, as, uh, as I was saying before. 
Uh, furthermore, like uh, all other countries, uh, Ukrainians are looking for a good uh, career path, but uh, in a reasonable way. What I mean? Uh, if uh, we compare uh, Ukrainian with the Russian or Indian or uh, with the Indian and Filipinos, uh, uh, Ukrainian wants to make career in a normal period. Uh, Filipino, they are confident and comfortable to stay five, six, seven years in the same rank. is like their comfort zone. And most of the time are the company that are pushing them to, to join on a higher rank. Uh, Indians is other way around. Uh, they are extremely ambitious. They are looking for uh, uh, fast promotion. Uh, I had the candidates or officers second mate that after two contracts of four months each, they are already looking for the to, to join as chief mate. Uh, Ukrainian in this respect uh, are. are well balanced. Uh, they uh, uh, are getting promoted or asking sometimes promotion only when they are confident that they can cover the, the higher rank. So these are the main points uh, which uh, uh, we are looking on the Ukrainian. Last but not least, especially compared to Filipino, the PNI cases that we do have with the Ukrainian are uh, extremely low compared to other nationalities. And uh, uh, we are asking uh, the P&I only if it's really needed. So we are not uh, wasting money on, uh, on P&I cases like uh, for uh, some other nationalities. The extremely, extremely low case ratio for, uh, for P&I. So, <clears throat> I mean, just touching on that, you know, on, on, on claims, you know, uh, P&I claims. I mean, are you talking about on the health side? What, I mean, are you talking about on... You know, uh, uh, you know, employment issues. What, what, what particular claims are you saying that they're not as excessive? Uh, you, usually, we are talking illness and injury. Mostly are related to illness and injury. Uh, just yesterday, I was uh, asking Tamara a recap of the cases. If I'm not wrong, we have two cases in two years, right. and uh, uh, we have. Uh, um, let's say more Filipinos than Ukrainians. So uh, also the selection that you do with the Filipinos sometimes can uh, help you to get lower uh, P&I cases. But uh, with the Ukrainian ratings and the officer, probably one in two years, if I'm not wrong. So. And is, that, is that more linked to the fact that um, obviously if they've got something wrong with them and they're ill on board ship, they're going to want to be looked after. I mean, that's, that's important. But are you saying that they don't tend to um, use the system to rectify maybe past ailments and past issues? Is that what, that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Um, also, um, and, and, and Tamara was to, to, uh, touching on it, I think, earlier about the concentrate on the certain cities where you're getting the maritime influence. Um, are you seeing that as far as the supply of seafarers? Do they come from certain parts of the Ukraine? Yeah, especially from the cities um, close to the Black Sea and uh, compared to Philippines, India, uh, Indonesia, uh, is extremely easy uh, for them uh, to travel to any international airport. Uh, Philippines is an archipelago, so uh, sometimes it, they will need a couple of days to reach the capital city. Uh, with Ukraine, in uh, 10 hours by car you are in Kiev, or uh, one and a half hour from Odessa you can reach Kiev and then any other international destination. So also the mobilization of uh, Ukrainian crew is extremely faster compared to some other countries. Yeah. So this is uh, also strategically located, uh, very, very easy for them to reach uh, every place. There are excellent connections with Dubai if you need to bound to east, uh, uh, east side of the globe or even, uh, even um, Istanbul with, with Turkish. So connections are excellent. Ukrainian airline, let's say that has to be, grow up a bit, uh, but the connections are very, very good internationally talking. Um, we've, we've heard, we're starting to get some questions coming through, and thank you to the participants for that. I'm going to, before we go on to Henrik, I'm going to ask a couple of questions here. Um, let, let, let me go for this one. It's coming from an, uh, an anonymous attendee, but um, 
uh, and I'll, I'm going to put, put this over to Luca and then maybe Henrik might like to, to, to comment on it. But traditionally, many companies avoided hiring Eastern European crews due to high alcohol consumption. Well, uh, yes, it was true. Uh, when I started with the Ukrainian crew, it was back on 2002. Uh, we were looking for uh, some uh, crew engineers, especially because there was and there is still a lack of engineers for a Roro ship 35 years old. We were looking for engineers and the very beginning also probably because uh, the agency, the manning agency that we have decided to use was not making the screening. The alcohol was a problem. Yeah, we had uh, several cases. Uh, nowadays, I don't have memory in the recent year of uh, people drunk or Ukrainian drunk because we don't have to forget that uh, all uh, all nationality can be can be drunk on board, not just uh, Ukrainian. So uh, nowadays, if the screening is done properly, checking the reference and uh, making additional steps that um, Danica is is providing, then is no longer a problem, or at least not. Uh, like other nationalities. So uh, same as Filipino, Indian, Chinese, Italians, uh, uh, British. So it's no longer a problem as, as it was before. One has to remember actually this year in December, it's, uh, I think there was a drinking tradition, the vodka and so on in the Soviet Union times, not to step on any toes here. Yeah? But, uh, but it's, it's a 30, this December, it's actually 30 years ago since the Soviet Union collapsed. Yeah? And they, as Lucas says, uh, the generation of seafarers we have today, they have, uh, and working on board today, they have grown up uh, in a different world uh, all the time working for international ship owners and so on. So that's, that's, that's has changed. It's a new generation we have here. Yeah. And maybe I can also add that just um, when some years ago I worked for a big a large ship manager, we had some statistics with different nationalities. And the highest frequency compared to the number of crew we had was actually the British crew drinking and then the Scandinavian crew, and then came the Indian crew, and then the Filipinos and the uh, East Europeans were about the same level. So, um, right, right. Yeah, I want, to, I want to add that nowadays also have uh, dry ships, a zero policy on board is helping this. Uh, 20 years ago was not like that, or at least uh, very few companies that were dry compared to nowadays. So this also yeah. helps. I mean, that, that, that absolutely, that's going to be helping on this. And um, there's one question here that's come in. Um, uh, and maybe Tamara might like to touch on this. Um, uh, no, excuse me, this would probably be from Tamara and also for, um, for Michelo, um, that and we know that uh, 12,000 seafarers graduate annually, uh, about 12 years of intake. Does this mean that most seafarers do not want to continue their career at sea after 40 years old? Okay, uh, yep. now uh, we have annual graduation about uh, 2,000. Uh, per year, 2,000 persons, but uh, we have uh, different uh, stru uh, structural divisions in Mariupol, in Ismail, uh, we have uh, institutes in Odessa and uh, some colleges, uh, full-time, part-time education, and total number about 2,000. And uh, uh, usually during education, uh, we have uh, maybe 20% uh, uh, drop out uh, in accordance with different uh, reasons. And uh, maybe uh, most, uh, most of those who graduated uh, from academy, uh, maybe 90% uh, stay uh, at sea uh, more than five years. Right. Uh, because uh, it is very attractive uh, if we can pay uh, salaries uh, on shore and uh, uh, on board of ships. Uh, uh, of course, uh, many of uh, our graduates uh, prefer to stay at sea. And uh, many of uh, seafarers uh, work at sea up to may maybe 60 years, 60 years old. Uh, of course, some of them uh, go to show to different uh, positions, some of them uh, as uh, our instructors and teachers, some of them uh, obtain positions in uh, different maritime offices, uh, crewing agencies, 
as a superintendents uh, and so on. But uh, many, many of our uh, seafarers stay at sea uh, for years. Okay, Henrik, if I can pass over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just, um, um, as, as Luca mentioned, some, some questions were also maybe coming in here, I can see um, um, how, how do we ensure that we get the best seafarers on board, yeah? And uh, in, um, uh, maybe also we were missing a little bit in the presentation actually to think about now. In, in Ukraine, there is uh, a lot of uh, manning agencies. I guess there are, uh, I thought the last numbers were 600 or something like this. So 600 manning agencies. The reason is that in the past, I think it was quite easy to get a, a manning agency license and many captains uh, tried the, the lock this way uh, or seafarers or senior officers um, to, to start up something. Um, but at the end, uh, I think if you look apart from the big ship managers who, of course, are in Ukraine, right? Then maybe there are a handful, five to ten, or five to ten, uh, let's say, seriously many agencies. Yeah. So I will. Uh, I'm not promoting Danica, but I'm just saying that uh, if you are looking at Ukraine, you should be looking at uh, not the smaller agencies, but but the larger agency. Um, and then uh, how in um, all the years. Um, I have known, I came first time to Ukraine in 2000. Um, and over the years, we have de developed different things uh, on how to select the seafarers, right? Or to select the best candidates. And uh, what uh, often it is actually just a question, do the, do the seafarers have the right certificates? Do they uh, have the experience with the cargo and the, and the Indian types and so on? Are the medical fits? Uh, and uh, any negative uh, references. Um, I'm, I'm trying to say it a little bit different way. Um, we, we need actually people on board who can think and act rather than people who are experienced there. Um, and that we have uh, in Danica developed this um, or adapted uh, this uh, triangle we have here below. And actually we see each of our candidates uh, having five elements here. Yeah? So everybody I have some talent and IQ, uh, and everybody have a set of personal characters. Um, then we have some knowledge, all of us here, and knowledge is what we read and, uh, and learn in school and uh, universities, and we have some skills. This can be welding or screwing or, or navigation and so on. And finally, behavior is actually how we apply all these things here. Mm. Um, and when I say this behavior is something we are looking at a lot at, at Danica when we uh, screen candidates. Um, because um, if uh, I, I always give this example here, so we have maybe a captain, or everybody of us has had a boss or manager in the office, right? He was very knowledgeable, he was uh, had a long experience, uh, he was uh, actually an intelligent guy, yeah but our manager was uh, acting uh, like an idiot. And all these good uh, skills and knowledge and so on are, are lost if people are not applying them in the right way and cannot talk to other people. So I think um, we, need what is, we need actually to find people. Of course, they should be skilled somehow and have the knowledge, but it's important that uh, new candidates have the necessary IQ and also the right behavior to, uh, to uh, apply these things here. Yeah? And they can meet new problems, and with the IQ, they can then deal with these problems also. Yeah? Um, and I had one time I actually a chief in the some 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 owners was asking for a very specific uh, oily water separator experience here yeah, for the chief in the year. And the chief in the I was interviewing said, Do you have experience with this? Because the owners want this. He said, No, but I can open the manual and read about it. Yeah? And that's maybe more important to have experience in every little point. Um, so um, yeah, this is this is our our uh, how we look at the screening actually, and uh, these three here are green because in general this is something which can be changed by training, and the two here are are blue because uh, this is something the personal characteristics are something talent is something we are born with right, more or less, and the personal characteristics is something we are introduced in us when we are very young. And uh, normal 
employers or shipping companies can work on, on the green ones, the blue ones uh, are difficult to change and require, requires doctors and so on to change and therapy and so on. So that's, that's why. Uh, can you please, uh, next slide, uh, Sean? Yeah. Um, so in Danica, we, we have a 12-step uh, screening process here. Um, and uh, this involved very fast that we review the applications we have. Uh, we have like 45,000 seafarers applying with us. Um, and 65% of them are in a one year period actually updating the sea service, so it's quite, quite uh, uh, up to date uh, data we have. Um, then uh, we have, um, if they're not living far to, uh, yeah, in, in these COVID times, it's of course nearly always telephone interviews. But otherwise, if they're living far, the, far from your office, uh, we, we, um, we do a, a telephone interview. Then we try to, we get permission from all the seafarers that we can check their backgrounds. So we try to obtain references from their previous employers here. And when all this looks good, uh, then um, the candidates have a short interview with our recruiter to verify the sea services uh, and uh, different things that they really have been on board the ships and so on. So we got different tricks uh, to do this. And then everybody is uh, passing a seagull this test is a professional knowledge test, and we do a Marlins uh, test uh, if owners requires this. Um, and in additionally, we actually do a cytometric test optionally also. Uh, we use a Thomas test, which is a fast uh, test. Uh, it does not give a full picture, but it supports the, let's say it can verify or disverify the impressions we get of the seafarer. Um, so yeah, and then we have, of course have the technical requirements and finally, uh, we have in our office also uh, uh, senior captains and chief engineers with seagoing experience on same vessels who are doing interviews. And finally, our recruiters and uh, put all together. If senior officers, they will also go to some of the senior management. And finally, the clients get uh, our candidates. So this is how we work. Can you next slide, please? And I think one more. Yeah. Um, so this behavior, this is uh, how, how do we actually uh, do this. Uh, and uh, the candidates, of course, do not know it, but uh, today we do it over Skype, it's a little bit more difficult. But uh, in, the, in the normal times, uh, when there was no COVID, all candidates are asked to come to our offices. And uh, actually, we do a systematic uh, observation of the candidates when they're in the office, how they behave. Uh, uh, like uh, Odessa is a touristic area, so uh, with a lot of beaches in the summer. So if the captain for a chemical tanker asking for fourteen thousand dollars per month coming, asking for a job with us, and uh, he comes in slippers and shorts, uh, he misunderstood something. We don't require people to come in the uniforms, uh, but how they behave? Are they have a normal behavior in the office? Do they speak nicely to the reception? Um, and all this uh, we are observing. Our, our staff staff is trained in this. And also we have some standard questions we can ask. Uh, we can ask uh, like, uh, why did you go to sea? And maybe they have very structured answers to this or they have something uh, more vice versa answers and so on. And of course also there is, um, it is not only, um, there are more major staff also with senior officer experience on board who is involved in the screening process, right? Um, and they finally, all this we put together and also we have the psychometric test we use and we can compare if the psychometric test is about results are the same as, as our impressions. Uh, so that's, that's how, we, how we do the behavior assessment actually. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the process, the, screen, the screening process is quite detailed. Um, and before we come on to the Q&A, uh, the questions are starting to come in. Um, I mean, I'm going to ask you straight out, you know, the, 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 the title of the, the webinar is, you know, Ukraine, the crew source of the future. Why do you think Ukrainians are the crew source of the future? You know, we've heard a lot of good stuff here, but what, you know, in a nutshell, why are they uh, the crew source of the future, Henrik? Yeah, I think the, the, first of all, they are there by mass, right? So you see there's a huge, uh, huge education uh, going on here. Yeah? It's an attractive job for the for a long time to go also. This will take a long time, unfortunately, until Ukraine lifts its shore base uh, earning possibilities, yeah? So, um, and the education is uh, high standard, yeah? And it is, uh, as I think one different things with the Ukraine, and it was cleaned up in Ukraine some years ago, uh, there were a lot of training centers. And today, there are a few government controlled uh, institutions where the training takes place. 
and that uh, also included that raised also the quality level of the training. So we have a, we have a lot of uh, good training facilities here, um, and uh, and and mm. as a good school, it's attractive to go to see. And the culture, I think also that is traditionally, yeah. So as, as Tamara mentioned, we have many seafarers in the second generation, even third generation, yeah. And everybody has somebody who who worked at sea. Yeah? So and uh, that's 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 thing. And as Luca mentioned, also the seafarers. If if you go in the classes of a uh, University and ask the students there, what are you going to be? They are not going to say I'm going to be a second officer. They are going to say I'm to be going to be a captain or chief engineer. And that's that's important. They are into it uh, for the career, the young people. Yeah. Yeah, they're dedicated to it. I mean, you talked, I think one of your slides there said it's not about, it's making sure that you don't employ the wrong person. And I think that's quite an important element there. Um, but how how difficult is it? I mean, we talk about competency, you know, and and you've got your minimum standards and your SDCW and, and MLC and what have you. But how difficult is it to source competent seafarers? I mean, you know, the industry's changing at the moment all the time. and And... and Talk to me a little bit about how that, that, that challenge that, uh, that, that the industry is facing in, as far as competency is concerned. Yeah, I think, okay, the, the industry is, is changing and they're coming new fuels and uh, new propulsion systems and so on, but it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah? So we still have a new building coming out with the old systems and it will take another 20 years before these are phased out. So it will be a long period. I don't think, I mean, we need, we need the training in these new things. Yeah. So, um, but it's not it's not going to happen overnight. So I think it will come. I think that would be cope with. Yeah? Um, but I think what is mentioned there before, uh, what I mentioned before is uh, that behavior or let's say the talent and so on becomes more important than have knowledge and skills maybe. Yeah, when, because when things are changing, you have new problems, and then you need the IQ and your behavior to deal with these problems. Yeah, you cannot uh, rely on your so much on your experience. Yeah, so that becomes a more important. Point, I guess. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm going to go to the. Um, we've been doing really well here, actually. We've been we've been talking for nearly an hour already. But um, coming on to the questions, uh, there's a question here from uh, from Ian Stokes. Um, how are Ukrainian cadets supported during the sea phase of their training? Uh, you know, we've been talking about this this problem about junior junior officers and, and what have you. Um, who, who would like to answer that? Um, Luca, do you want to have a go at that and then maybe bring in uh, um, uh, Michaela as well on that? But Luca, how, how are the Ukrainian cadets being supported during the sea phase of their training? Well, first of all, uh, if they have the chance to, to join as cadet uh, as company, we have to instruct the master chief officer, a second engineer, how to train them. Uh, they have a booklet, of course, but the main focus is that they are there as apprentice, not as a deck boy, not as engine boy, not to clean uh, for uh, eight or 12 hours per day. Of course, uh, some, some works uh, are, uh, according to me, necessary, like to go on deck uh, to make the first experience on shipping, painting, because in the future you will be the person responsible for them. So uh, you need to have the dirty hands, especially when you are a cadet or a junior officer. Uh, about, about the cadetship, uh, I want to say also that uh, not most of, but many of the Ukrainian officers are coming from ratings because they have problem to, uh, to get a contract as cadet. So probably they were sa sailing as OS, AB for some contract, and then after they were be able to join as deck or, or engine officer as oiler. So in this respect, uh, it's, uh, we, we notice the difference from people that is coming from oiler than, than a cadet, because uh, most of them are much more practical. And then after they acquire the, um, the knowledge, the theoretical knowledge, how to, to solve the problem. Uh, about the training, so uh, there, there should be a good induction to the head of the department, regardless its engine on deck. <clears throat> and then there should be on, uh, on monthly basis or every second month, uh, a report of what the cadet, uh, of what the cadet did. That's the, 
So uh, needs to really take care of. Otherwise, if you are not following from the office side, they can be lost spending six, seven months doing a useless job that they are not helping them to grow up professionally. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you made. That <clears throat> maybe they're coming through the ranks, so to speak. You know, um, uh, you know, into office level rather than from cadets. I mean, that, that, that's great and that's, that's a good opportunity for them. But surely the industry does need to resolve this whole issue about cadets are there, they're trained, give them a job. They need a job. Yeah, also that's why usually they are slightly older, the Ukrainian, compared to other nationalities. <clears throat> uh, I, easily you can find uh, uh, third mate, second mate, not younger than 23, 24, when in some other nationalities, they are already senior second mate or already chief mate. So it takes yeah. a bit longer, but at the end, uh, the result is, uh, is better. Just to recall to what I said before, that uh, they don't like to stay longer in a, in a certain reg, but they are not timing to, to be promoted faster. So it's the, just the right compromise about experience and ambitions. That's a good, good point there. Michaela, can I just get your views on this? Because I think, you know, if I was a, if I was a young, you know, budding cadet going into the industry, you know, I'm going to want to know that I'm going to put in all of that effort and I'm going to hopefully come out and I've got a job to go to. I mean, what, what, what are you hearing from the cadets uh, that, that you're training and the graduates? You know, how worried are they about um, maybe, you know, getting a job at the end of it? Uh, now uh, we have uh, many agreements with different companies uh, and uh, last year about 150 companies organized uh, on board for cadets. Uh, and uh, during the time on board, uh, uh, they uh, receive good uh, training and uh, most of uh, students uh, want uh, to continue the sea service uh, and only some of them uh, stay at shore. Um, some of companies uh, organize uh, training uh, for more than 50 cadets. Uh, every year uh, up to 1,000 students have on board training and uh, most of them receive position as a cadets, not uh, as an AD or uh, motormans, uh, but we have some students who uh, already have another higher education. They study in our academy for second education uh, using another form combining uh, part-time and correspondence course. Uh, and uh, these uh, persons are obtained positions as uh, AB or motormans, uh, uh, but most of our cadets uh, have training as a as a cadets uh, as apprentice uh, on board of this, and uh, of course uh, most of them uh, prefer to stay at sea after graduation. Okay, thank you very thank much, you. Michele. Uh, um, I'm going to um, and thank you. Um, obviously, further inquire out to the delegates. You know, please send through questions. We'll carry on chatting for another ten or, or fifteen minutes or so. I want to touch on and, and you know encourage all the the panelists to stick their hands up and, and contribute on this but we've got this big issue of the COVID-19 pandemic that the the shipping industry has been facing um you know for the last year and a half and what have you and this whole issue about COVID vaccinations we've got a question that came in here what measures has the Ukrainian government taken regarding COVID vaccination rollout Henry, do you want to answer that one first? And we'll start that little debate on yeah, exactly. the whole issue of COVID and vaccines. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, Ukraine is uh, like all other places of the world uh, lacking vaccines. Yeah. Um, and uh, there is, of course, the intention to vaccinate the seafarers uh, as soon as enough vaccines are available. Yeah? And so that's the that's situation. But for the moment, there is no... Um, they are not. They are, we are not so. I think Tavar, we are not so far yet uh, that we came to the priority group of the of the seafarers. Yeah. Okay. There is no separate seafarers group. Or let's first no, of all no. say yeah. Only the by uh, age uh, we have the and by status of engagement for doctors, military. Uh, but uh, we small steps we are moving on ahead. Uh, so 
waiting for more and more vaccine, uh, of course, to arrive uh, to the country. Right. But I think we can also say there that the, um, the, the I mean, the epidemic is, of course, also in, in Ukraine, right? But um, it, it was worse a couple of months before, and now we have a low, a lower numbers, yeah. So, um, and we have, um, we can see that uh, in uh, in May we had one percent of the seafarers joining testing positive on the on the PCR test, and uh, that says the two things that the that the um, that the epidemic is is quite low, yeah, and also that the seafarers are sticking actually to the self isolation. We impose. Uh, Actually, seven days, at least seven days, uh, self isolation before joining, yeah. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, the seafarers are sticking to this. Otherwise, we have seen a higher number of the of the positive PCR tests. Yeah? So that's that's where we are. So, so looking at this, I mean, during the pandemic itself, I mean, where um, the, the repatriation issue was, and that was another particular point. And how did it affect the Ukrainian seafarer? I mean, was he also stuck at sea for 15 months or 12 months and you know, still stuck, was, and also able and capable of just getting on with it and, and, and understanding that it's, it's, it's something that, that is happening at the moment within the industry. Do you give me your perspective on it, Henry? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think we had somebody sitting 15 months on board, but we had the seafarers, I think, nine, 10 months uh, up to, yeah? Um, and as, as Ukraine was not too much affected by the pandemic, uh, they were relative on the, are relative free to travel. Yeah, it's more the problem is the the other end, the port where they have to join. Um, and of course, last year when the whole well, there was no air, the whole uh, all flights uh, cancelled and uh, no travel at all possible. We had we had problems. Yeah, in general, uh, I mean our seafarers coped with it. Of course, we had the cases uh, where people get depressed and so on. We also had the the um, the um, the networks are helping uh, with the, um, mm. the 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 what's it called the um, repatriation the repatriation and so on. But we had also the the support from the from the churches and the, all the oh yeah the welfare organisation yeah. organisation exactly yeah to um, to help us yeah and the seafarers had free access to them and so on so so it it helps something but of course uh, some strains. Uh, practical problems comes up. Somebody do not see their daughters being married or, or, or graduating from schools or, or some, some seafair families are planning to move houses here. Yeah? So, the, so the, the husband goes to sea for four months yeah? and he comes home and in that period at home he was planning to move house. The house is all the house is old, the new house is bought yeah? and the wife has himself, herself has to, to take care of everything. So these practical situations they were affected by and of course this uh, affected the boot on board. But I think in general, and we had also people really depressed, of course, this is clear. But in generally, people survived at this uh, time. And, and now we have a different situation because everybody going on board now. Also, I think that time, seafarers on board did not realize how life was ashore suddenly. Yeah? Uh, and they did not understand maybe what goes on. And now we have another, people were home, they see how these isolations, the lockdowns and so on are working. And when they come on board, they have a better understanding. Also, maybe I'm not coming home after four months at land. Yeah? So, um, so <clears throat> looking at, uh, we've got a couple of more minutes left, I mean, looking at the future now, and we're talking about, the, you know, Ukraine being the cruise source of the future. Um, I just want to get, a, get a, a little bit of an idea from, from all of you, just on the, you know, the, the extent to which the, the, the situation for Ukraine seafarers is going to be, to, to be stronger for the industry. I mean, you know, we're talking about it being a, a preferred um, career path against IT and maybe running your own business. So there's a good attraction there for, for a young Ukrainians to come into shipping. And there's also an attraction there from ship owners and managers to employ Ukrainians as a crew source. What, what do you think you're going to be telling me in about a year or two years time? As to, are you going to be seeing growth, do you think, as far as take up of the Ukrainian seafarer as a, as a, as a crew option? Uh, Luca, do you want to start that and then maybe on to Tamara and then uh, Henrik and then uh, Michele? Luca, your thought? Well, according, uh, according to me, the, the future of the Ukrainian market is, uh, is bright. Uh, as uh, as company and uh, as myself, even in my previous experience, uh, we were pushing harder for, uh, for Ukrainians. So we, we do believe that uh, 
are uh, an excellent alternative to the two leading markets of uh, seafair. I'm referring to India and Philippines. Uh, while Indians number, especially on a dry side, it's very hard to find, uh, Ukraine is still an excellent market for the, um, for the seafarer, especially, uh, I would say, and uh, Tamara or Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, for the bulk side or dry ships. Ukrainian was, or, and still mainly, a place where there is uh, a strong uh, dry bulk routes, uh, because was uh, was an export uh, place for, uh, as Tamara was referring about, uh, cereals, grain, and all these things. So uh, uh, I would say that the future is uh, brilliant, dry, and also tanker, because in the recent year also they have moved to the tanker fleet where Russian were probably much stronger than them. So now, uh, even if they have uh, uh, a good uh, background in the dry, also on the tanker side, they are started to be really competitive. Yeah, okay. I hope in one year time, when we have the next webinar, we see uh, bigger numbers <laughs> of Ukrainian seafarers uh, yeah, joining the uh, uh, international companies. Uh, so uh, I hope, yes, uh, it will be like this. Uh, okay, uh, for today we saw the figures that, uh, different figures, and uh, uh, we, don't, we don't know for sure which one is uh, right, uh, so official, uh, but around, uh, as per beam cars, is around 35,000 uh, Ukrainian officers all over the world on international vessels, yeah? Mm, uh, and uh, we should also not forget get our internal course and river vessels yeah, inside the country. So uh, I believe that still, uh, yes, uh, this is um, a good chance uh, for the uh, young generation and uh, um, um, open-minded uh, cadets uh, for the future, uh, for the bright let's say future, yes, uh, uh, to prove uh, yourself and uh, to also earn uh, good money. Um, this is uh, 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 what is really possible and achievable, yes, um, with the training, education uh, and your aims ahead. So hope it will be like this. Brilliant. Yes, of course. Um... We have many different problems. Uh, now uh, we have not pract practically our own fleet. We have not uh, sufficient support from the uh, side of government. Uh, we have uh, low, low salaries for teachers and instructors. Uh, we ha have ineffective lending system in Ukraine, difficulties uh, of organizing on board training, but we have very good uh, prospects. Uh, we ha have uh, high motivation to work in officer positions in international shipping, high potential uh, for increasing the number of ship officers. Uh, and now we uh, use, all use uh, active uh, seafarers as uh, teachers uh, in our academy. They kind uh, sea service and uh, work in academy. And uh, we have uh, strong support uh, from side of industry, and we hope in future we will have more and more companies which will support maritime institutions. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we have only one uh, training ship in Ukraine, but we hope that we will make a reconstruction of this ship and uh, resumption of uh, full a fledged operation of our training ship. Now we started a program uh, with uh, teaching uh, in English and already several groups of students uh, study uh, all subjects in English. And I hope uh, that our specialities are very attractive uh, for Ukrainians and uh, we hope that in future more and more uh, our citizens uh, will uh, choose uh, maritime uh, uh, specialities. And now, as you know, uh, already Ukraine has the second place in Europe as an uh, officer supplying uh, country uh, for ships under 
uh, flags of European country. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, why should Ukraine not be the future, right? So you, you have a huge population here. Uh, there's a seafarer tradition and there's a strong education system, which is, uh, as Mikhail have just mentioned, uh, it being improved also here. Yeah? Certain courses are only teased in English, yeah? so, um, so that's, that's the thing. And um, the, the government is actually supporting the young people to go to sea. I think they also government see this as, a, as an income for the country. Um, so the half of the, of the student places are, are free here. Yeah? And, uh, and the, the whole situation that we discussed before also is, is actually from a, from a salary point of view. And if you want a steady income, a steady job with a good income for your life, you should go to see here. Yeah? And the young people understand this. Um. Brilliant. All right, Henrik, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, it's been a very good debate this morning. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of gone over to uh, nearly an hour and a quarter debate. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the delegates for their questions who've come in. And as I said, we'll be um, editing the, uh, the recording of today's webinar and putting it onto the SMI website. Uh, so, you know, I would encourage everybody to, to visit the shipmanagementinternational.com website. I mean, it's, it's all um, uh, stories and comments uh, to do with all of these issues that we've touched on today. Um, but I'd like to say a, a, a personal thank you to the panelists today. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed talking, talking with you and meeting you. It's been, uh, and it's really, really good to get, a, get an insight uh, into uh, this very, very important uh, part of the market. Thank you.